the so-called unmarked grave situation is a very good example of this. Instead of addressing those terrible conditions, we now have hundreds of millions of dollars going to people like Keisha Supernon to take her ground penetrating radar equipment and to roll that across fields when there's been no substantiation of any kinds of clandestine burials. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that there aren't unmarked graves. Like there are unmarked graves in cemeteries and there were many unmarked graves because um, the crosses deteriorated. A large number of children died at various times of history because of the epidemics and so on. But that's not the claims that are being made with respect to these clandestine burials. Adam Sos here for Rebel News, and I'm certainly no apologist for residential schools, but conversations surrounding Indigenous issues are often politicized and rendered very much unintelligible due to rhetoric and political correctness. People in Grassy Narrows are suffering from mercury poisoning. You Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for your donation tonight. I really appreciate the uh, donation to the Liberal Party of Canada. Uh, often preventing meaningful progress, whether in a practical or academic setting. If we can't get to the sort of crux of things and have truthful conversations, while well, the process of truth and reconciliation, as they call it, goes right out the window. Um, I'm joined very shortly here by Francis Widowson, a former professor in economics, justice, and policy studies, um, who was as we talked about in another interview, basically showed the door for asking some of these tough questions. Francis is a, a controversial um, a researcher, shall we say. Uh, she's a pretty terrific teacher. Her, her students at the time um, respect her a great deal. Uh, I know um, many of them. Mm -hmm. um, the issue with her, though, was that she, uh, she had built or started to build a career uh, questioning uh, what essentially is the sacred cow of uh, Aboriginal affairs uh, in, in Canada. Um, and she's been approaching these topics, Indigenous topics, uh, for much of her career uh, and sort of cutting through that smoke screen that often clouds uh, Indigenous issues. At Rebel News, we're obviously happy to ask those tough questions and get to the truth of things wherever that may lead us. And I very much suspect that Francis Widowson, Professor Francis Widowson, is doing the same thing. Uh, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, if you could just maybe give us a, sort of a bit of your background in, in, in the field of sort of Indigenous uh, research, and then talk about some of the work you're doing now on this important conversation, particularly residential schools, the discovery of mass graves. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I have been involved in Indigenous policy, uh, studying Indigenous policy, I guess, since 1995. And then with respect to the residential schools, um, it, was it was mostly after the Truth and Reconciliation Report came out in 2015. Well, well undoubtedly, the most shocking piece of, uh, of uh, information that we uncovered was the number of children who died in the schools, the number of children who died... Uh, uh, was a significant number, and and we think that we have not uncovered anywhere near what the total would be, because the record keeping around that question was very poor. I thought that that was not a very balanced report, and uh, wanted to contribute some of my um, research to that uh, the discussion about the residential schools. Um, that's when I developed um, a couple of articles. Like I presented an article. I believe it was in 2017 at the Canadian Political Science Association, um, just sort of developing my theoretical idea of neo-tribal neo rentarism, the political economy of neo-tribal rentarism, which saw the residential schools as one of these areas which was attempting to extract compensation um, to maintain um, the various kinds of processes which were happening with respect to Indigenous politics. Um, that was developed into two chapters in Rodney Clifton and Mark DeWolf's edited volume from uh, Truth Comes Reconciliation. And then everything started to become much more intense in 2021 when um, it was announced that the remains of 215 children had been found at the Kamloops 
Indian residential school in an apple orchard, what used to be an apple orchard. Um, that immediately led me to be somewhat uh, suspicious of those claims just because it wasn't really, really no evidence was provided of that. That seemed a bit strange mm -hmm. that there would be so many clandestine burials and that there, this would somehow be secretive. And then um, I was contacted by Nina Green, who is a very, very significant researcher, almost an IF Stone figure on the residential schools. And that resulted in a group forming, which is known very sort of informally as the residential schools research group. There's about 17 um, sort of dissident uh, researchers, some academics, some uh, judges, um, some just kind of uh, independent researchers that are, you know, look, looking into all facets of the residential schools. But my area of expertise is the Kamloops case, because I've really basically focused almost all my attention on the Kamloops case, and then wrote an investigative piece on that, which came out in February uh, of this year in the uh, magazine, The American Conservative. It's called Billy Remembers. And it's basically making the argument that what happened with the Kamloops case is actually quite similar to what happened uh, during the satanic panic in the 1980s, where there was this hysteria that was fomented by people who really wanted to believe journalists and supporters who really wanted to encourage these sorts of stories about satanic abuse amongst uh, children who are making these testimonials to that effect. And those kinds of testimonials that happened then are quite similar uh, to what was sort of happening in the Kamloops case, which was um, rooted in the conspiracy theories of a defrocked United Church minister by the name of Kevin Annette. And Kevin Annette's the role that Kevin Annette played in this story has some similarities that, that what happened with respect to the Michelle Remembers book in the 1980s satanic panic. Right. And so for those, those mass panic instances, very often the sort of onset of them is a legitimate concern. Um, then that becomes misconstrued, um, often due to a lack of information and, and understanding. So lots of people who get caught up in it, they may be coming from a place of authentic concern, but then government officials weigh in, people are trying to capitalize. Um, Justin Trudeau would have been one of the forefront people in the, the satanic panic where he would have been kneeling or whatever he would have been doing to take a picture. Politicians always seem to get ahead of these things yeah. to try and gain popularity. That's what we saw. And then once once the information and the report started unfolding that maybe this wasn't quite true, well, all those politicians, they don't really, they don't come back and retract. They don't apologize or correct. They just kind of leave it. They scored their political capital. They just try and walk away. Um, if you could share a little bit, though, I know, I know we've heard some pretty there's a pretty wide array of things. Some people still saying, oh, there's 215 kids there. It's the worst. And then it's it's 100% for sure. Other people saying that further research has indicated that they misidentified an upturned apple orchard. And they're basically looking at roots and disheveled soil. And there's no bodies whatsoever. And it's a complete fraud. What? Where does your fi finding sort of fall on that spectrum? Well, I think it's important to point out, first of all, that it's we we always must remain open to the possibility of this being the case mm -hmm. and really what we need to do is look at the evidence for this and what's required is excavations to be done um in the area well first of all we need that report so there's a ground penetrating radar report that was compiled by Sarah Bullyu that has been kept secret by the band, so no one has been able to look at her findings at all. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. That report needs to be made public. Um, and then um, the only way we can confirm or disconfirm the existence of these, uh, what has been alleged to be human remains, but of course not human remains, soil disturbances can only happen through excavations Ground penetrating radar will not do this because it cannot distinguish between the different kinds of soil disturbances. Um, so that's the first thing is that that's that's kind of the claim. And we really need to push hard for the RCMP to 
It supposedly opened an investigation about this in 2021, but there was some interference. And we're just finding this out now um, through a committee hearing that was held in June 2021 that Murray Sinclair was interfering in this process and suggested to Sarah Bolio, Bolio that she obtain um, legal representation when the RCMP were beginning to ask her questions about this. So we need the RCMP to reopen the investigation. We need that report to be made public. And then we need for the excavations to proceed. The Kamloops case is very, very important because it's the one where there's direct allegations of clandestine burials being there. It is the case that started off everything in terms of what appears to be a hysteria. And so we need to start with the Kamloops case. So there should be all, all eyes on Kamloops and we should be demanding an impartial investigation of everything that's happened there. Well, and we, we talk about hysteria, and in, in some cases, it can be sort of innocuous government campaigns, the propaganda. And in, in the case of Canada, we saw mass arson vandalism, even like Vietnamese communities that just escaped persecution from communist governments establishing churches here after, like, I mean, in the 2000s, well after the last residential school closed in 1997, and their churches were, were lit on fire, they experienced arson. So this wasn't simply an innocuous sort of oh, well, this is bad, or Marilyn Manson is a villain and we need to not have our kids listen to his music. This resulted in what can quite easily be called terrorism on Canadian soil, which is extremely problematic, um, the sort of smoke screen, again, no pun intended, uh, mm. that that often faces Indigenous issues, seems to be here. If, if, there was, if you were talking about a development in Calgary where they were starting to dig a foundation and there was some sort of allegations that there was human bones everywhere, there'd be an immediate sort of crime scene investigation. We yeah. didn't see that. Um, before we get into sort of that conversation, though, there, there's the sentiment that sort of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. There's mm -hmm. extraordinary claims here, virtually no evidence, and yet politicians absolutely ran with it. Why do you think that is? Um, well, I think uh, there's a couple of reasons for for this. Um, the first is is generally what's been happening with Indigenous politics over the last, I guess, thirty years, is what you know what I've called uh, neo tribal rentierism, which is instead of trying to address Indigenous problems with providing better services, money has been distributed to various Indigenous organizations. And this has kind of been the pattern. So whenever there's any kind of opposition or discontent or grievance that is brought forward, mm -hmm. money is is distributed. And, and the whole uh, claims about genocide and the residential schools, and that has all been about extracting compensation. Instead of dealing with the obvious social problems uh, which occur with respect to that. So that is one kind of area. The second area is wokeism, <laughs> which we talked about in the last interview, but indigenous politics is, you know, very, very deeply entwined with wokeism, which is uh, what uh, Rechtenwald, Lindsay and Fleckrose uh, referred to as reified postmodernism, which means that if an oppressed group uh, has a claim in order to help them overcome their oppression, you have to um, accept that and to promote that claim. And this, you know, residential school genocide survival, a survivor identity is one of these aspects. And I, I really wanted to mention this, which I think is a major part of this problem, is there's a whole segment of universities that has been corrupted by this. And you see this very, very directly in the residential school, uh, Kamloops case, um, even presidents of the university, uh, a president of my university, rushed to say that the bodies of 215 children had been found and that all professors must help, uh, you know, the survivors of residential schools in their grieving process and so on, when there had been no evidence at all that had been provided about that. So that was very, very irresponsible. And these academics are continuing on this campaign uh, 
which is very disturbing because we've had a few media outlets, mainstream media outlets, the National Post and the New York Post um, have written sort of investigative pieces. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of academics, but the most prominent are Keisha Supernon, Sean Carlton, and Negan Sinclair. Those three academics immediately smeared anyone who was expressing um, kind of, you know, questioning or skepticism as being residential school denialists mm -hmm. and basically implied that they were similar to Holocaust deniers. And, and these kinds of smears are preventing anyone from, you know, feeling comfortable asking the questions that they need to ask with respect to this. And this has impacted journalists. There's no doubt about oh, it. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Nina Green has been sending out for the last year mass emails to 100 journalists correcting all the misinformation. And this has largely fallen upon deaf ears because these journalists are deeply ensconced within this, supporting whatever it is that these, you know, so-called knowledge keepers are saying and are afraid that if they question those knowledge keepers, what's called knowledge keepers, the same way that they would question any other type of person who's making these. Like a, like a of, new, newly developed vaccine or something like that. Something like this. Like it, it really is very improbable, the, 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 the case about Kamloops. Um, and no and, one, with the exception of a few people, yeah. um, are really asking the hard questions which need to be asked about it. That's it seems so pervasive. And like what we've been hearing for two years now through COVID-19, and this is an aside, but trust the science when the, the the research isn't out from the drug development companies. Similarly here, we're hearing like trust the trust the ground penetrating radar that nobody's seen. Don't ask any questions. It's a concerning overall trend uh, to, to not be able to ask questions, whether it be in medical development, whether it be in in uh, in light of these residential schools um, to jump back a little bit, though among your sort of group is is anything confirmed now or is the fact that this is being concealed in the smoke screen preventing like there is no evidence affirming this but has there been any counter evidence are there any sort of counter claims uh debunking this or is it just a fact that that, that no one's being allowed to look at this in a critical way well, it's it's very suspicious the way everything is unfolded so so we can't um you know, prove a negative. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no way to do that. But it's it's the onus is on the people who are making the claims that there are 215, the remains of 215 or 200 uh, children there to substantiate that. And when things were first announced, you had a couple of pieces of evidence which seemed to indicate some um, something was perhaps not uh, not right in Kamloops. One was a tooth, a juvenile tooth, and the other was a rib bone, a supposed human rib bone that was found there. Mm -hmm. Any all the questions. So the tooth was found not to be human uh, by Simon Fraser archaeology. So that initial thing which was presented was not true. The human rib bone, no one has verified that at all. We don't even know where that is. And the RCMP, if you announce that you found a human rib bone, yeah. um, the claim is that a tourist found this human rib bone and presented it to the museum um, of the Kamloops band. So is that normally how human remains are dealt with in yeah. these kinds of cases? It just is so suspicious. The, the last piece of evidence that's come forward is um, a website by a person with the pseudonym Cam Rez, um, who has a, a website called Graves in the Apple Orchard. Um, he evidently, I, haven't, I don't know who it is, but evidently Terry Glavin and Jaime Rubenstein have had some interactions. It is an architect or an architectural consultant who has an interest in aerial photography and he has presented a whole bunch of evidence about the kinds of excavations that have gone on at the Kamloops site since, I believe, 1917. So that's been highly, the soil there has been highly disturbed by all sorts of different things. 
So why is it that the ground penetrating radar expert, Sarah Bullyu, thinks that those disturbances that she's found are indicative of, quote unquote, uh, probable graves? That doesn't make yeah. any sense. The last thing that I should mention, which is, you know, cast doubt onto these claims, is that there is not one missing child that a parent is saying never, there's no names, there's no um, identifiers where people are saying someone has gone missing. Um, there was the Fifth Estate Program in January 2022, where you had a whole bunch of new claims, one person claiming that she saw four people hanging from a barn, right? So what about the questions, Fifth Estate? You know, yeah. who was the principal at that time? Who were the teachers? What was the class list? Um, were there reports at that time that four children suddenly went missing? You know, these kinds of hard questions, which anyone would be asking in any other context, cannot be asked uh, on this in this case yeah. because they will be immediately called a residential school denialist and uh, a racist and a white supremacist and all the kinds of um, sorts of smears that happen when anyone, you know, holds Indigenous commentators up to the same standard as any other person who's making these kinds of um, dubious claims. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to speaking with you as sort of more comes out. You would think now that a certain level of scrutiny, even by some mainstream outlets, has started to be applied to this, there'd be a sort of urgency to, okay, let's excavate and prove the point. The fact they're shying away from that is extremely suspicious. Um, just quickly, and then we'll wrap up here, though, but there are a number of other issues, whether it be sort of money going missing or the lack of access to clean water occurring for Indigenous communities in this country right now. And I feel like the same sort of we can't look, we can't act, ask questions mentality, which I refer to as a sort of smokescreen on Indigenous issues when it comes to mass graves, is causing not only sort of a lack of clarity on the ills and wrongs of residential schools in the past, but it's preventing actual progress and amelioration for communities currently particularly, I mean, clean drinking water being the most evident one, where more than enough money has been spent. If there, there's a there's a community that's under a long term drink water advisory, from 1995, two years before they closed the last residential school, if that was a white community or a, a, a city community, that, that wouldn't last six months. But is it the same sort of metric of no accountability and we dare not question or look that's, that's creating that environment of suffering? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, uh, my own take on this, and this is a major area of my own uh, research, and, and actually, there was a piece that just came out in the Globe and Mail about a week ago by Ken Coates, uh, which said that despite the billions of dollars that are going in, and there's it's been massive increases of funding, there's no improvement, no improvement in the conditions. And this needs serious scrutiny. And basically, what's happened is... It's this sending money to the communities instead of providing the services. This is the pattern that Indigenous politics has taken through the last 30 years. And what's needed, these are state of emergency, uh, state of emergency situations in Indigenous communities, terrible alcoholism, fetal alcohol syndrome, low educational levels, the drinking water, and so on. Those services to improve those conditions need to be provided by the government with proper accountability. What's happening now? Money's just being sent. There's no real effective monitoring of what's going on. And that money just gets diverted into all sorts of different kinds of initiatives, which really are not addressing these conditions. And the unmarked graves, the so-called unmarked grave situation, is a very good example of this. Instead of addressing those terrible conditions, we now have hundreds of millions of dollars going to people like Keisha Supernant to take her ground-penetrating radar equipment and to roll that across fields when there's been no substantiation of any kinds of clandestine burials. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that there aren't unmarked graves. Like there are unmarked graves in cemeteries and there were many unmarked graves because um, the cross has deteriorated. A large number of children died at various times of history because of the 
epidemics and so on. But that's not the claims that are being made with respect to these clandestine burials, right. which is that there are secret burials of children in apple orchards. Be, and the kind of the implication is that these children were either uh, murdered or there was some foul play that was involved. There is no evidence whatsoever for this. And all this money is going into all these efforts to try to, you know, document this. That's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars. And not to mention using that as a way to extract more money, to send money to neo-tribal elites, lawyers, consultants, the whole Aboriginal industry mm -hmm. uh, that Albert Howard and I were documenting in 2008. On that note, uh, Professor Francis Whittison, I want to thank you so much. If you're interested in this topic at all, that book that was referenced is Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry, an absolutely essential read if these topics interest you. Again, thank you so much for joining me speaking about this. I'm sure we'll speak again in the future as some of the story develops. Thanks so much. And for everyone at home, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. For Rebel News, I'm Adam Sos. Well, the remains of 215 children have been found in a mass grave in Canada. Many of you know that just over a year ago, the discovery of the remains of 215 children was found at the Kamloops Indian Residential School at the Kamloops Shiswemek First Nation. But what if I were to show you that what I just said wasn't true, and that in fact, a year later, not a single body has been found? This mass grave is a painful reminder of the genocide. Canada's leaders aren't condemning the burning of churches. No, they're endorsing the burning of churches. A juvenile rib bone that surfaced in the same area. You'd be surprised the number of people who say, you know, I'm a doctor, I'm a paramedic. This is definitely, you know,